And here we go. All right, rock and roll. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? So tonight on the stream, we have a special guest, Brennan Lee Mulligan on here. He does lots of cool stuff, D&D, College Humor, Dimension 20, stuff like that. So um, he is here hanging out with us for a couple of hours. We are going to he's going to give us his spiel. We're going to talk about him. I'm going to talk about, you know, traumatizing experiences in his childhood and all that kind of cool, awesome Woo! stuff is going to be beautiful. And then the second part of the stream, we're going to be doing some Q&A where you all can ask him questions and stuff. In fact, you can start asking questions now. My lovely moderators are going to be taking down your questions so we can get to them later. So that's that's the dealio for tonight. So, Brennan, what's up? Welcome, dude. Luke, my goodness, my man, thank you so much for having me. A pleasure, an honor, a delight. Uh, uh, truly, uh, the, very, very into the vibe already. Uh, excited to talk D&D &D and chat about this wonderful game. Awesome. Yeah, dude. D&D, &D, baby. <laughs> Woo! Baby, rolling some D20s. Oh, um, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, well, hell yeah. Um, uh, if I can, I'll, I'll jump in just to introduce myself to yeah, uh, uh, to your wonderful viewers. Uh, my name is Brandon Lee Mulligan. I am the GM and host of Dimension 20, which is College Humor's uh, house actual play series, uh, where we take a bunch of awesome College Humor alumni and we play D&D uh, &D 5e together with a bunch of fantastical comedic homebrew settings. Um, and we've done about, like, about eight seasons in the past two years of the show. Uh, and it airs on College Humor's streaming again. platform, dropout.tv. Uh, so if you're into rad actual play, people playing homebrew 5e with very funny people, uh, please come check us out. It's been an absolute ball. We have a good time. All right, beautiful. Now, hold on a second. I, I really, that's all wonderful, but I really just have one question. Shoot. Since when have you been a dungeon master? I took on the mantle. I mantle. Took on the, the mantle. The mantle. <laughs> the glorious mantle. Of what does the this dungeon. mantle look like? What does this mantle look like? I I see it as kind of a a velvety, resplendent Santa Claus red, a thick red mantle, the, something to, to hold against the coldness of the night as you take your friends by the hand and uh -huh. journey into the unknown. Does it that come, is the mantle of the dungeon master. Does it come with a beard and a sack? Oh yes, a hundred percent. You get a the beard. The sack is full uh, okay. of all kinds of encounters and monsters and oh, traps and beautiful. experience rewards, and the beard is full of like Cheeto dust and snack crumbs. <laughs> Cheeto dust. That's awesome, dude. <laughs> I like the little. Okay, so when you come visit my house, all right. So like, I like the little. They're like barbecue little twisty ones. They're like Frito makes them. Do you, you know which ones I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, 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 because because obviously the visual of the big puffed ones is like fun, but mm -hmm. for actual snacking, you want the little twisty curled up ones. Yes. I feel like yes. Uh, the flavor profile is there. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I think the real because listen, we could talk about encounter design, we could talk about all kinds of important stuff, and we will believe me, we will. Snackage, D and D snack. How do you lay the snacks out of your table? I am a big old snack hound. I uh -huh. actually get a fair amount of shit from fans. Just, oh, I'm sorry, can I, I don't know if I can curse. I'll watch my language. Uh, I get a fair amount of guff from fans <laughs> um, <laughs> because I snack on camera a lot. So mm. we just shoot, dude, we like bad dude. shoot. Holy crap, dude, I do it all the time. I'll be stinking running a game and I'm eating popcorn or I'll be a player and I'm eating popcorn. And then I get people in the comments who are just like, it's 20,020 and you're not muting the camera while you're chunk snacking and stuff. I can hear you crunching. Come on, man. I'm like, and I see these comments. I'm just like, okay, I'll push the mute button, but I'm eating my popcorn. <laughs> I, you, you can't, what kind of a performance do you expect if all of your favorite players' blood sugar is tanking, baby? Dude. Be realistic. We got to keep that blood sugar up. I know. It's like, I don't care if I'm streaming and people are watching it. It's like, I'm eating my popcorn, dude. You know? A hundred percent. Well, here's the thing. What, for you, ideal table, right? And like, so let's say mm. streaming or otherwise, like yeah. home, home game, whatever. What's the ideal <clears throat> snack situation at the table for you? Do you like a spread or is there like one go-to thing for you? Ideal snack situation. All right. 
some cookies and yeah. cookie cookies are good but so popcorn is great too man i get some popcorn and those little twisty dorito thingies or frito things those are not doritos frito things those are good um probably like a beer behind my dm screen is good you know so they can't take it from me you know <laughs> um but that's pretty good i like uh the little little debbie cakes and crap those are really good you know it's got to be like junk foodish type stuff pizza i mean pizza's a staple i love the pizza oh know? for sure well yeah. that's the thing is i think that if you're going for a marathon session the strength of pizza is is the grab it and go-ness right it's like mm -hmm. if you're doing a big combat you don't even need to break for dinner necessarily because as you know it's like when it's my turn i'm here i go get another slice when my turn is over people can eat and in you know coming and going i'm also thinking about back when i was in college and did like 18 hour monster sessions of like start at 11 a.m play until sunrise the next morning D, D sessions where for me it's like you need my for snacks it's like you need some kind of cookie or some instant sugar hit yeah i also like something a little bit more proteiny i'll be honest like some almonds some nuts something that's like this is going to actually satiate me a little bit more and then damn i'm trying to think of the last and i guess the other thing is beverages right it's mm -hmm. like I'll usually start coffee and move my way to something else caffeinated, like a Coca Cola or some other caffeinated soda, uh, because you gotta you gotta keep give your machine the fuel it needs at the end of the day. Oh yeah, totally. I definitely need something with caffeine in it, like uh, energy drinks, like rock star energy drinks. So everybody's heard everybody's heard of the monsters, but the problem with the monsters is they're expensive, dude. It's like I don't know, it's like two three dollars a stinking can, but the rock stars are usually on sale at a store near me for like a dollar each, you know, if I catch oh. it at the right time. So it's like, okay, we're gonna stock up on 10 rock stars and those are gonna last me a couple months of D&D games, you know, that give me energy, the energy that I need. So, yeah. Hell yes, 100% about it. Um, well, yeah, so that, uh, 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 but yes. So going back to our earlier topic. Yes. To answer your question, the mantle of the Dungeon Master. I started playing, can, can you believe how much we veered up? Baby, that was a tangent. We, we tore off on that. Um, I jumped uh, into, into running games when I was 10 years old. And the truth mm -hmm. is, I you know, the, 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 the gap from when I first played to when I started running games is just a span of a couple of months because I was so little that I didn't have that perspective of like self doubt to be like, whoa, 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 buddy, take it easy. Like you're not, you're not there yet to be able to run games. Cause I was, you know, I'd like, what was it fifth grade or something like that? Like I was, I was itsy, you know, itsy bitsy. Um, so I started running games when I was 10 years old for my brother and my close friends. And uh, it just took off from there. I've been running games ever since for 20 plus years. You said 10 um, when you were like 10? 10 years old, yeah. Oh, yeah. dang, dude. It was a, a little, little guy. You got My, me beat, man. I didn't, was that? I, you've got me beat. Like I, I started running when I was like, probably about 15, man. Crap. That's the thing. I mean, I was playing <laughs> all the time when I was 15. Mm. I just got, I just got into it early yeah. early um the the story behind it was so my mom is a comic book author she wrote comic books back in the day her name's elaine lee and she threw comic books and through a bunch of other things like that you know like she was working at san diego comic-con like way back in the day uh uh and knew of, of D, D through all these different nerd channels and basically was like hey i think this game would really suit you just sort of like because i was very into fantasy lord of the rings stuff even at that age mm -hmm. um and so she put up a flyer in our local gaming store, October Country. Uh, shout out to local gaming stores, support your LGS wherever you are, especially during the pandemic when uh, they're probably shut down or, or at least have like reduced hours. Uh, make sure you're supporting them. Um, and uh, essentially like got me into this first group where a group of incredibly generous 20 somethings taught me how to play the game. Mm -hmm. um as a little kid when you were and 10 when, when you were 10 when i was 10 okay truly the act of saints like i remember myself being in my 20s the <laughs> idea that some i would be at my local gaming store and someone would be like could you please 
uh, invite a child to your home game and te- it's like damn that's that's a that's a generous thing to do so hopefully i didn't gum up the works too much but i played with them for, for a couple sessions to just learn the ropes mm-hmm. and then was like okay let us let us take you know the lessons i have gleaned here and impart them to my other tiny uh, child friends yeah that's awesome like just just like either you were very well behaved for a 10 year old and not like super annoying or something or they were just super like you said saints and just were like okay cool we're just gonna take this dude under our wing and like and, and show him what's up so um yeah. To, to, uh, uh, I honestly think the two descriptions you gave, uh-huh. I think they were actually both true. I think I was very well behaved and mm-hmm. super annoying. Like like that kid on The Simpsons, what's his name? Martin Martin Print. I think I was like, yeah. I've written a backstory for my character. <laughs> like I was like that kid of like of them like, hey Brennan, like do you want to come learn the rules? And it's like, Prithy, refer to me by my character's name alone. So like, yes, very well behaved. Not not a great time to be around. Dude, like you that's how you spoke when you were a kid? <laughs> well, like I was very in it, man. Uh-huh. Like that was I, I just like that was the the world I operated in. You know, I had this this wild thing. My my brother and I who, you know, we like grew up together um uh playing the game together. We're like, yeah. you know, inseparable as kids. We're very close uh, uh as as brothers go. Um we ended up going to this like spring festival, very pagan Beltane uh, festival that had, you know, like swords. It's very like Ren fair e basically. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was nearby us. And there were recruiters for this live action role playing summer camp that we ended up playing at and going and attending. Me and him ended up working there for years and years. Still do occasionally. How old were you at the time? 10. ten. When we so got this was still 10. Okay. Still ten. Okay. So I think our first summer there was like eleven or thereabouts. Mm-hmm. But we so we went to this we went to this festival, and there the whole job. I was dressed as a wizard. My brother was dressed as a court jester, and these two adult larpers came up uh-huh. to us to, to like drum up business for their larp camp. And I remember the the story they told about coming up to us because we were in costume, being like, "Oh, these kids are prime marks," and their whole bit was that they were like semi in character, and that's how they were getting kids into the LARP camp thing. And so they came mm-hmm. up and were like, "What ho, young travelers? Have you heard of the mythical?" Re-? And little ten year old me was like, "Stop! I sense an ill omen," and was like, "Oh, they're like, oh." damn this kid is like like way off the rails already uh like, <laughs> we are very, like we truly i think i gave one of them a uh, a a rune reading i like yeah. cast these norse rune stones the the futhark or whatever mm-hmm. uh uh and uh gave a rune reading from one of them while my brother ran a marionette show we were like deep in it and that's sort of that's that could sort of be the byline of almost every story you're going to hear tonight is we were deep in it <laughs> that's awesome dude that's very <laughs> cool so you started learning it and doing live action role playing and stuff like that man yeah i've yeah, never done was... i've never done that before i i feel like i feel like if i were to do live action role playing i would probably become hopelessly addicted and nothing else would get done you know like everything would just come to a halt it is, I mean, it is an incredible experience. Mm-hmm. I don't think you're wrong. And truth be told, I was addicted to it. Like, uh-huh. thank God it was a summer camp or I would have been there all year long, right? Like, it, it's a it, it's a very different th- thing. You know, there's always been this funny part of me in, in comparing the differences mm-hmm. between LARPing and D&D, yeah. right? I always, the way I've always kind of put it is like, when people are like, oh, D&D, that's pretty nerdy. I've always sort of been, uh, sort of like not aghast, I guess is the right word, but I've always been like, hey, I honestly think D&D is a lot less nerdy than maybe you've heard. Yeah. This is literally just us. We're just gonna be hanging out, having some drinks, eating some snacks. And like 80% of the game is just like doing bits and telling a story together. It's yeah. like D and D far from like when I think of things that are nerdy to pursue, all of the long hours I spent building magic, the gathering decks were a thousand times nerdier than D and D, which is inherently <laughs> social. Yes. You're yes. like, 
You're yeah. like doing, you're just like hanging with friends. Yeah. LARPing is nerdy. It is. is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's, it very, crosses the line. <laughs> it, even for me, and I love it. There is nothing like being, you know, in costume and yeah. character, yeah. racing through the dark woods. You got a foam sword in your hand. You're battling it out in the underbrush. <laughs> the you're like, you feel your adrenaline pumping. And then yeah. you get back and you're like, you know, you see your king get struck down by an arrow. You go, my liege! And tears yeah. streaming. And then you, and you go like, oh, that, yeah, that crosses the line. That's definitely, that's, <laughs> that's, that's some real shit. That's a That's new awesome. That would be stinking <laughs> awesome, man. Now, is there, is there like, are there dungeon masters in that? Or is it more like collaborative? Or, and, and, and to what extent is LARPing like um, the end, the end is unknown and yet to be determined and more like scripted? You know what I'm saying? I would say that LARPs are way more scripted than D&D is, generally speaking. Now, what's really, I mean, what was really cool is like, all of my DMing experience, because I obviously was DMing games constantly. I mean, hell, I would like run D&D games at the mess hall while we were at LARP camp. Like, <laughs> shocker of shockers, big overlap between the kids at LARP camp and people who wanted to play D&D. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But the, uh, what was really fun and interesting about it was the idea of like, um, I was, while I was like honing my DM chops, I was working as a story writer, like one of the, the game writers for this LARP, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of adult hobbyist LARPs tend to be set in a single world and they kind of continue. Our LARP was the opposite, very anthology, where like mm -hmm. every, every week was a new game. Sometimes we would have summers with like multiple games in a series where it's like, oh, wow, we're gonna have four entire connected game nights. And that'd be like a big deal to have that many games in the same setting, playing the same character. So really our LARPs were more about, we're only gonna go to this world one time and you're gonna have mm. a very intense four to five hour experience. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we play a, a night uh, game and a day game, yeah. you'll do four or five hours and then this, but mm. it's just so much more intense because you're fully in character the whole time. There's sets that are decorated. There's mm -hmm. special effects, makeup, and everyone's costumed. Yeah. And, and the whole game is structured such that unlike D&D, &D, where you're seamlessly moving in and out of first person dialogue, but yeah. third person yep. narration, yeah. you're describing your character or, yep. or at least the DM is describing things in third person. Mm -hmm. With LARPing, you're not narrating shit. You're really just doing it. Right. Yeah. So there's this wild element there of like, um, looking at so when i was writing these games the way the games tend to work is more like a murder mystery weekend mm -hmm. where um ours was also interesting because it was it was for kids and teens so there was a lot of like creating an ex basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a script that can be communicated to five to twenty people right mm -hmm. that are kind of like the story player characters where they have they have a flow sheet they know there's certain beats that in the storyline that kind of mm. have to get hit but ideally those are so broad stroke that within that individuals can make improvised contributions that will really matter mm -hmm. on a relationship to relationship basis or on a scene to scene basis, but that the overarching story uh, is not gonna get disrupted by them. So if you're gonna mm. write a LARP game, you're gonna go like, okay, it's a battle between the forces of good and evil. The orb gets split apart into seven pieces at the beginning. The PCs need to go and find, and when you say PCs, you're talking about like 40 to 50 people, mm -hmm. need to go and find these seven orbs. Some win, some losses. They do a big spell, there's a final battle. This happens, right? Mm -hmm. And a structure that that's that is that broad doesn't feel constricting because people have so much freedom to make moves within that larger structure, okay. but it still provides a satisfying ending to a story mm -hmm. more so than just a free for all. Okay. So there's, there's a very broad framework of what needs to happen in the story, but within yes. it, the individual actors can kind of, they have a lot of play room, freedom to do what they want to do. Exactly. Okay, which is exactly. where, because the, 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 the thought in my mind, as you were kind of describing at the beginning, was like, okay, if everything's already predetermined, why is it fun to do it? it you know what I mean? So if, 
So I mean, <laughs> well, that's the interesting thing is 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 not to dive too deep into mm. it, but it is a really fascinating thing yeah, to talk yeah. about. And for people that haven't checked it out before, there's also levels of complexity mm. based on, um, based on who the game is aimed at. And this is something that I think most DMs will actually hear and realize it's pretty familiar, right? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're running an intro game. This is for younger campers. These are for like, you're, you're targeting like 12, 13 year old campers that are coming for the first time. Probably the setting is like high fantasy. It's like the elves of Gelgador and the dwarves of Dalhambrin have met. Oh no, the evil Lich Lord has arrived at the <laughs> wedding to mess things up. You know, that classic kind, yeah. of, kind of situation. Uh -huh. And what ends up happening is that game would have a flow sheet of events that would be pretty scripted mm -hmm. and player choice ends up often being like, there's three different quests happening that are being led by three different leaders. Which quest do you want to go on? And they're like, I'm going to go on quest number two. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, all the kids that want to go on quest number two, come down this, the red trail for this quest. And then at the yeah. end, the only the only real dramatic question in a very simple story like that is, are you going to win the final fight? So all mm. these quests kind of happen, yeah. and then you know maybe you like assembled a bunch of tools, and now you have all these cool cool magical gear, yeah. and we have the big final fight, and you're mm. probably gonna win, hooray, right? Right. But that's the big the big dramatic question is, do we win the final battle? So the the possibility of failure exists for the final battle then. Is that what you're exactly, saying? Mm, exactly, okay. right? Um, yeah. So yeah, the possibility of failure exists at the final battle. And that's enough of a dramatic sort of momentous mm -hmm. thing yeah. that the fact that the quests are very kind of prescriptive, because that's mm -hmm. the thing is for a new kid that's just so overwhelmed by like a hundred people being in character and costume, having a very rigid structure of like, hey, we all met up at the Oracle's cave we are going to go on there. You have three different adventures you can choose. Mm -hmm. They're each going to last 20 minutes is the kind of structure that, that a young kid is going to really appreciate. Or honestly, mm -hmm. even like an adult beginner might mm -hmm. be like, okay, this is so overwhelming. Yeah. That just having someone tell me like, actually, you know, there's a big conversation in D and D about railroading. Yes. And, yes. and <laughs> right, exactly. And this is the same thing where every DM that has done it a lot actually knows that if you're running a game for like your office coworkers mm -hmm. for the first time, or you're running a game for your cousins at a family vacation, mm -hmm. a little bit of railroading is going to be necessary. Like if you're not playing mm -hmm. with people that have played before, mm -hmm. having some mysterious stranger at the tavern be like, goblins are attacking, go mm -hmm. stop the goblins, is actually kind of a relief. Your players mm -hmm. go, thank you. Like I just wanted an adventure. Yeah. I, I'm not at a level of you know competence or, or of com not even competence, of comfortability to like seize the narrative reins myself necessarily. Yeah, it's a, it's a totally different type of game. And if you have a defined plot hook that somebody could pick up and run with and go do, go on a set adventure, or if you just have like, here's a world, what do you guys want to do? Like you need some experience, not only to play that game, but to run that game, you know? It's a whole a different million. level and to make it fun because anybody can run that game and, and it could just be a, a total lame letdown. But to actually make it entertaining and fun for everybody at the table, that's a whole nother level. Yeah, a million percent. And I think what ends up happening is if you are lucky enough in life to be able to run a campaign that goes for a tremendous amount of sessions, I have seen with a lot of people that they campaigns that started very railroady and very again like like prescriptive where, mm -hmm. where the dungeon master shows up and says don't worry guys i have an adventure ready like i have a dungeon i have a plot hook like i'm gonna take care of you right mm -hmm. when you're in those campaign worlds for long enough i think there is naturally a point that people get to where the pcs feel more comfortable taking the reins. Again, it, that's mm -hmm. dependent on the players and DM trusting each other. It's dependent on the PCs kind of having some good storytelling instincts themselves. Mm -hmm. But what I think you find is when PCs have lived in a world long enough, sometimes you get your PCs who will be like, you know, we'll say something like, hey, there's this, this, you know, necromancer that keeps showing up and stealing this stuff from these past three dungeons. 
let's go kick this guy's yes. ass. Mm -hmm. And as a dungeon master, then you get to have the fun of being like, cool, you guys tell me, how do you prepare? Do you go to town and get like, that can be very, very fun. Cause obviously mm -hmm. as a dungeon master, it's a lot less work, I feel like, when your PCs know your campaign world well enough that they start to make moves on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that's an easy kind of campaign to start. I think that honestly, when a campaign is starting, a little bit of railroading is a good thing. Yeah, but I totally agree. Like once once they've done a few adventures and stuff and get level five or six or something like that, there's they have a feeling for that existing world and they can start to, even, even if the dungeon master is still going to go off and prepare an adventure, they can still say, hey, we would like to do X thing because that appeals to us and that the dungeon master can go off and prepare that and they can run at the table but the beauty of that is that the, the players are starting to care about that game and when they tell you that we want to do x thing you know that they're interested in doing it because sometimes you know you might prepare something give them a plot hook and they'll be just like oh okay we'll go do it because it's the social contract and we know you made an adventure for us but it's not the most exciting thing in the world you know but when they're all jazzed up for a thing and then you go prepare it you know it's a little bit deeper it is a little bit more something you know yeah i think that's spot on and there's definitely again you're always going to have to do prep work mm -hmm. but the the you know deep sigh of relief that comes from doing prep work when your players have communicated to you maybe like you know you you do a debrief after a session people are like oh that was awesome and you start getting texts and emails from your players the next day being like hey we've talked about it we're going to take these these cursed magic items we're not going to give them back to our guild leader we're going <laughs> north baby we're going to we're going to take these things and yes. and run i mean the fun of that right is uh -huh just about taking stuff off your plate. Being a DM is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And and like you're saying, the main thing is like motivation. If PCs are telling you, hey, we're motivated to do this, you know, as a DM, great, I don't need a plot hook. I literally just need logistics. I just yep. need to know what's in your way. Yeah. You're telling me where you want to go, right? Yes, um, yes. I, I think hate, that's I, huge. Yeah, I hate plot hooks. Like. <laughs> I hate having to write, like I write, I like write adventures and stuff like that, you know, for whatever. And plot hooks are the worst part of it. It's like the dungeon, the description of the rooms, the design, the layout, all of these things are beautiful. I can do this. But it's like the plot hook, you know, and I mean, I know how to write a plot hook and crap. It's not the problem, but it's just like, it's not my favorite part. So if like, like you're saying, if that were to be taken off my plate and all I have to do is create the dungeon or if it's an event based adventure or just what's going on, if that's all I got to do, it's so much better for me. Yeah. Well, that's the thing too, is that the hardest thing about plot hooks, right? Is that number, is that <sighs> the issue with plot hooks and I could, I could really get on a soapbox here if I wanted to. The issue here with plot hooks, right? is that plot hooks in movies and novels mm -hmm. and TV, the stuff that we think of, like, you know, how much of D&D &D is us trying to live in Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, to live in these like epic pieces of media that were heroic and fantastical that we know and love, mm -hmm. right? That hero's journey, right? And the issue with a lot of plot hooks is, in classical storytelling, plot hooks are as much about the internal reality of the of the heroes as they are about the situation in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think what every DM has struggled with sometimes is this thing of going like, is relying on stuff that feels generic for a plot hook, where you're like, okay, you get to the town of Tr Tremblydale, the orphanage, it's getting attacked by On winter fire. wolves. Oh, <laughs> buddy. Those orphans are so sad and scared. Yep. It's orphans. You got to help orphans. You, gotta, you got to. <laughs> you got to. Or or you end up going like, ah, the mysterious uh, hermit says, uh, there's a great treasure in a dungeon. Uh, don't you... Don't you idiots like treasure? <laughs> you know, like, as a, as a DM, you can feel really um, limited uh, trying to make, uh, here's what it is, I'm like rambling. 
it's oh, yeah. really hard to make a one size fits all anything. Mm -hmm. And when you're designing an adventure, there is often a lot of pressure to make a one size fits all plot hook. Mm -hmm. And that can be really challenging because mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, I go to orphans or treasure all the time because I'm just trying to think of what's so over the top yeah. that nobody could resist it. Yeah. It's, but I think as any DM knows, planning adventures around PCs that you know better is always easier. Like if you have that one player character that has something that's like, you know, it, it could be a tiny bit of backstory. It could be something that happened in an earlier campaign yep. setting. Someone goes like, oh yeah, like I'm a, I'm a you know, divination specialist wizard. Uh, uh, my father, uh, you know, was a wizard at the academy, uh, but he was fired in disgrace and that's why. And then mm -hmm. you just drop in a session and you go like, you find a piece of correspondence. Uh, your father wasn't fired in disgrace. He was murdered. There was a conspiracy by the Academy of Wizards to have him killed. Right. And they covered it up with, and like, you can just feel how yep. much better of a hook that. Oh, is. yeah. But it requires collaboration from your PCs, mm -hmm. which is can sometimes be hard to come by, right? Not yeah, through any yeah. malice, but just mm -hmm. like, unless someone gives you that meat, you're stuck doing orphans and treasure all the time. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the true reason to have a backstory from a dungeon master's point of view, right? Players, they probably use that information to help role play their player characters and stuff. But from a dungeon master's point of view, it's what juicy little tidbits can I get out of here, you know, um, and and then create plot hooks, you know, like Krindar's sister and family, all this weird stuff that's going on, you know, and now his sister apparently is alive and she's looking for revenge against him because he killed his brothers, you know, and stuff is going down. And now his brothers come back as revenants that attack him. And it, when you have those type of backstory elements, like everything just flows because you know that Krindar is going to want to go do those things. You know, you don't even have to tempt them. It's just like, yep, I got to go find my sister. Let's go guys. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and again, like as a dungeon master, that's always going to feel like better storytelling because it is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it, I don't think that should be seen as like a defeat for a dungeon master. You just got to think about the fact mm -hmm. that like, one of the things we are all fighting at the table, and one of the things that I think DMs and PCs need to collaborate on a lot for a game to feel good is to not have the world, the fantasy world, be that aware of the DM screen. In other words, to not have that divide between players and DM really manifest in the world in that way. like. I don't know about you, but for me, like it can be hard if my PC, if my, if my, if my player character feels like a stranger in the world, it can be mm -hmm. really hard to get psyched about the adventures you're going on. And mm -hmm. it sucks because as a DM, you would love to believe like, oh man, I can just, this is honestly, and I'll get on another little soapbox here. Mm -hmm. This is honestly why I usually, unless I'm just doing like a one shot or something that's kind of fun and easy breezy. If I'm starting a new campaign, I do often want that collaboration between not only the players with each other, but with me as well mm -hmm. to be like, yeah, if I know who the villain of the, if, if, we're, if I'm planning like the low level arc of this campaign, mm -hmm. like we're starting at first level, yeah. I know who your like <clears throat> level five bad guy is supposed to be. If I can make that someone from your backstory, yeah. it's not only that that's better writing, God, it makes my life easier because I'm not going to have to trick you into caring. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's like like half of the questions I feel that are some semblance of, you know, my players, they just don't they don't go on the adventures that I write for them. They just wander off and go do random stuff. They climb trees and make pet squirrels and stuff. And that's what they do, you know. And so that's like part of that's part of the a lot of the frustration I feel, which is like which is why like so there's the Acquisitions Incorporated book that came out, right, that has yeah. you basically working for home office. You're a franchisee. Home office gives you missions and quests and stuff, you know, and then there's the patron system that came out with Tasha's, which is also in the Eberron campaign setting. And this is one of the reasons that I really like those that framework of having a patron or being like an acquisition incorporated franchisee because it really takes away that problem that i feel like lots of dungeon masters struggle with of like how how do i do the plot hook how do i get my characters to care now if we were kind of shortcutting it a little bit because you basically are just like all right 
Home Office has given you these three contracts. Which one do you want to take? So, you know, there's a little element of the railroading there. So you definitely would want buy-in from your players on that sort of campaign, you know. Um, but but it does help the Dungeon Master if, if this is something they struggle with. You know what I mean? So, you know what? Hot take here. This one's hot. This one comes straight off the press from one of uh, my players on Dimension 20, player on uh, NADPOD as well, Emily mm -hmm. Axford. One of the best to ever do it. Truly a, a, a world-class S-tier D&D player. And she says this, and here's the thing. Luke, specifically for uh, like people that run games like us, there's a lot we do, and especially in these channels, I would say 90% of the advice, 95% of the advice mm -hmm. that is out there for D&D &D is geared towards dungeon masters, right? 95% mm -hmm. of the advice I'd say is geared towards dungeon mm -hmm. masters. Check it out. You just lost your audio. E even 50% oh, of who's at the table, right? They are, uh, uh, the, uh, what Emily Ashford said that I loved was, mm -hmm. she basically said, there are so many things that are within the DM's power to control. One of the only things that is not in their power to control is what your PC cares about. Mm -hmm. And that in a very real way is your job. Like if you're listening to this and you play a character in a campaign, it's your job to find something to care about. The DM mm -hmm. has to make the dungeon. They have to prep the stat blocks. They mm -hmm. have to know what's in room 3C. They gotta do a lot of work. All of that work is for nothing if you don't make the choice to give your character a reason to be there. Like, mm -hmm. and I know that that's, that sounds intense, but it really is this thing where I almost worry, you know, we run a podcast called Adventuring Academy that, that has mm -hmm. so much GM advice. I give GM advice all the time, but I worry about overemphasizing it. Cause the truth again is being a player is not a passive experience. You are not just sitting mm -hmm. in your chair being like, like a foie gras goose, like getting an adventure stuffed down your throat. You're an active participant, right? Yeah. And so I think to your point, like that, that is the most common question. And like you're saying, but like you're saying that thing of buy-in and I think mm. that's it. And I would just say buy-in is the player's responsibility. You, that's mm. what you bring to the table. You are responsible for finding out why your character buys in. It's the mm -hmm. main responsibility you have at the table, I think. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, but, and I think too, that like, that is a huge part of, and I, I love the home office thing and I love patrons. I think all that is like having like a serial or like episodic structure to an adventure is great. Um, but I think that one of the best pieces of advice for, for players as well is when you're making an adventurer, I know this is, this is gonna sound so dumb, but I promise it's like actually advice I think a lot of people need to hear. When you're making an adventurer, don't forget to make them be a person who wants to go on adventure. Yes, yes, <laughs> I have an entire video on my channel, it's a rant. It's literally titled, Ple players, please make an please make adventurers or something. It's like, yeah. why? what is it with the dude who's like, yeah, I made this PC and uh, he's a blacksmith. His father was a blacksmith and he wants to be a blacksmith. And the dungeon master presents a plot hook and he's like, oh, I think I'm just gonna blacksmith some stuff, you know? And I'm like, and as a dungeon master, I'm just like, why did you create that character, dude? Like, did you literally, like, so you signed up for D&D, you want to play D&D and you rolled up a blacksmith. And now any adventure I present you with, you're going to be like, yeah, I'm going to go make some horseshoes. Sorry. It's like, why did you do that to me? Like, like I'm working my butt off here and you made a blacksmith, you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's yeah. so true, man. It's like, but again, it's, it's one of those things that I think there there should almost be like lessons or something for players or or at least more advice and conversation mm -hmm. <coughs> Whoa, excuse me <coughs> ah, good luck um there there should be more advice for players i think because there are all of these tools at your disposal online. Like, man, if you want to know how to make the most optimized multi-class oh, yes. build, Ugh. Ooh, you can oh. find a hundred pages and articles and comments Shoot helping you do that. But if you want to go find something that's like, hey, how do I make a character that's like fun? 
it's like going to be crickets out there, man. I swear to God, Dude. where it's, you know, yeah. like that's a real conversation. It's like every single YouTube video, everything on Reddit, everything for player stuff is just like, here's the top 10 combos of feats that you can do. The most, like top 10 overpowered must have spells. It's like everything is just all of this stuff. And so Dungeon Masters, look at that. They're just like, they're just wishing, they're hoping, they're praying. They get on their, their, their knees before their bed every night and they're praying and they're just like, please do not let my players see these videos. Please do not <laughs> let them make this crazy combo. Please don't, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's like, so yeah, you're right. But, but I think that honestly, one of the reasons we see those things as the top thing, that's what gets the clicks, dude. That's what's going to get the clicks on the video. That's what people are going to watch. And when we make the videos, when we make the videos that are just the hardcore, okay, here's how to be a good player. You know, here's the top 10 things to be a good player. You know, nobody's going to watch that crap. You know, like some people will, and then those people will get better to be played. But the majority of people are just going to be like, top 10 combo, let's go. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I, I do truly <laughs> hear that. And I think too that there's like, but again, it's like, you know, th their supply and demand do interact in weird ways. Mm. So it's like people, you know, it's like, yes, it's like, will the video about how to be a better player get the clicks? Maybe not, but maybe not because the people that, you know, are looking to how to be a better player know not to go look there. So it is mm. that weird thing where you have, to, you have to break that feedback cycle somewhere. But again, I would say that for, and look, I come out of a school of this, I am very much a munchkin. I'm a huge numbers head. I mm -hmm. love the combos. I love when <laughs> feats and different class features synchronize uh -huh. and you get great yeah. synergy in a character that's great. So but min maxer is what you're going for there. I think min maxing gets a bad rap. I think it's yes. not a dirty word. Yes, thank you. I'm a min maxer too. I love it. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. It's just it's just uh, it's just having fun with a system, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. uh, and it's fun to to give yourself challenges and to go like, mm -hmm. huh, can I make a character with this build work? How mm -hmm. like it's a fun mental challenge, it's a fun puzzle of like how do I like okay, what is the highest damage output I can get using this character build? Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, but I think what is true is, you know, definitely I am a very munchkin-y person, but I'm very much within the school of like story first players, right? Mm -hmm. Very like focusing on the storytelling, focusing on the narrative and the RP and all that stuff, but just have a lot of love in my heart for the number crunching as well. Yes. And, yeah. and what I would say is like the fun in your game is probably like is probably gonna come from some mixture of actual chemistry between you, but your friendship mm -hmm. with the people at the table mm -hmm. and actually being into the story of what's happening. Yeah. Um, because for all of its crunch and all of the fun of the systems of D&D, &D, mm -hmm. like we gotta be real, like D&D &D is a storytelling game. There is mm -hmm. no win condition. Like mm -hmm. you never get to, you know, put your hotel on Park Place and be like, great, I won, right? <laughs> like clearly the point <laughs> is to tell a gripping story. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise there would be a win condition. There would be some <clears throat> place where the adventure like ends theoretically. And that doesn't well, really exist in Well, there is a win condition. I kill all my players. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, first of all, on an emotional level, I hear what you're saying, but on another level, but the funny thing about that, right, is like clearly there, the, like the antagonism between the DM and the PCs. Mm. This is like a great example of that, really, mm. which is like the DM is so obviously a servant to the PCs, mm -hmm. Be and I'll say why. Because mm -hmm. if it was actually a fight, yes, I would just drop thirty <laughs> great worm red dragons on. Like if if there was like if yes. uh, if like an armed gunman had a family member hostage and uh -huh. was like kill these PCs, yeah. I would be like, oh god, okay, thirty liches roll up, you're all dead. Yeah, you know, like yes, it, like and so what is mm -hmm. the thing keeping a DM from doing that? Mm -hmm. It would be lame. That would be right. lame. Exactly. And we want the players to have a good time. Yes. Running a session is like cooking your friends a meal. You want them to have a good time. You're trying to put something together to let your friends have a good time. So, you know, within that, I think it's like, um, what you are looking for is that collaboration between DM mm -hmm. and players. And I think for players, like, your DM can make up all the cool stuff in the world. You need to make the choice to invest in it. You yes. need to make the choice 
to have some NPC that shows up and be like, man, I like that guy or hate them. Mm -hmm. Either is fine, but yes. just invest in the world, yes. right? Like invest in it, care. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that's my big, my, my crusade on what players at the table are responsible for, yes. which is to get invested. Yeah, absolutely. To actually care and do something, yeah, and contribute, yeah. And I definitely like, you were you were talking so we were talking a little bit about go uh, something came to my mind about the difference between like one shots and an ongoing campaign and you were talking about uh, referencing camaraderie between friends and stuff like that you know what i mean and that's mm -hmm. like like when i think of the games that i run the one shots with just some people that show up one time it's kind of like oh it's fun and stuff like that but the the, the real deep fun is the ongoing games that are just keep going where you have people that are playing, you know, and they are getting invested, you know, and you're bringing the things from their backstories are coming in and you're just laughing and having fun. And and there's some number crunching involved, which you referenced, but there's also the, the larger story that's developing, you know, it's like, so it's like the Dungeon Master creates a situation, players interact with it, and then a story results, you know, which is really cool. And then it just keeps on going, you know what I mean? So there's there's so many things we kind of touched on there that are just happening in Dungeons and Dragons that are just so super cool, you know. I mean, that's like the dream, right? Mm -hmm. Is is to to look back on these sessions and suddenly start to realize that you feel a sense of mutual ownership over this world mm -hmm. and you have this shared history and language. Mm -hmm. I I have a home game that's been going on for 11 years. That's awesome. Um, uh, and the friends that I have through that campaign, it, like there's a bond there that's hard to describe. You know, you've gone through all these adventures. And again, you know, I just read this book. Um, oh God, I'm blanking on the name of it. Book about psychology mm -hmm. and, and about, about neurology, psychology, and sort of how the brain works. Mm -hmm. That basically it goes into this element of like, your mind's eye, where you imagine things, is the same center of your brain that processes actual vision. Mm -hmm. Meaning that when your eyes send signals to your brain, you mm -hmm. construct visual imagery in the same little brain laboratory where you picture made up stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and memories of game experiences, mm -hmm. you don't have separate vaults in your brain mm -hmm. for fiction memories yeah. and real life memories. Yes. Right? Right. Um so this is not to this is not to say like the game is real. Like it's really <laughs> happening. It's like like oh if no. you die in the matrix you're going to die in real life. Like, it's like mazes uh, and monsters, dude. <laughs> yeah, I know satanic panic comes yes. back look out for the new chick tracks, right? Yeah. Um uh but um it is to say that these memories of this fictional world mm -hmm offer you an opportunity to find catharsis, make memories and share stories that regardless of their fantastical nature can be relived and treasured and shared just like you would share memories yes. of time spent with these friends, not using fantasy names for each other. So that's a yeah. pretty epic power to be able to pull off. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is the dream. I think those kind of campaigns, you know, they don't come along that often, but they're so, so special. Mm -hmm. And to not to, not to uh, you know, listen, camp, good campaigns fizzle out all the time for very legitimate reasons. But mm -hmm. I will say our, our 11 year home game, we had someone move to Los Angeles and mm -hmm. there was that moment where we went, are we going to, are we going to like end this now? Mm -hmm. And we made this very mm -hmm. conscious choice of like, we are gonna play less often. We're gonna fly across the country if we need to. We'll play mm -hmm. once around Thanksgiving and once around Christmas because we'll be yeah. all back yeah. home again. Yeah, and all this stuff like that. It, and we literally there were there were years where like if someone was broke or someone was having a hard time, it's like everybody else pitches in to get their ticket. You know nice. what I mean? Like yeah, that's awesome. That's commitment uh, right there, man. Yeah, man. And it's like, if, and I'm so grateful that we did mm -hmm. because it's like, you know, this game is, I, I'm hard pressed to think of something that I treasure as much as this game and the friendships, not that it represents, but that it has helped keep alive and healthy, right? Like, yeah, or, you know, that's a hard trick as an adult, but like, you know, a, like I think grownups need structures to support 
maintaining those relationships oh, whether yeah. it's a ritual yes. once a year where you get coffee yes. or it's a game or it's a basketball yes. game or whatever like i i love the way that games can bring people like so most of the players in my game started out as strangers i didn't know them they're just like random people grab them let's go let's go and play and i love the way this is one of the things i love about Dungeons and dragons the most it can bring together total strangers, people from different walks of the life, different belief systems, different worldviews, brings them together, puts them around the table, you play a game together, and over the course of time, you develop friendships around this game. And that could be said about other games too, but it's like, for, for whatever reason, Dungeons and Dragons is just, and role-playing games similar to it, you know, they just seem to have this thing where it's like, you know, they bring people together, you set aside your differences, you have fun, you enjoy the game, you know, and, 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 and you develop friendships and stuff, you know what I mean? And it's just this beautiful, awesome thing that it does and and it helps people cope with anxiety and stress and helps them learn social skills like there are so many awesome amazing things that DD &D and rpgs do for people that it kind of is like what were they on in the satanic panic thing like literally what were these people smoking to think that there's something wrong with this game like it literally has helped so many people in so many ways and continues to do so they're just like ah, yeah it's, it's crazy I hear you. Well, the conspiracy theorist in me is like, exactly, man. They didn't want people to uh, be yeah. a barbarian and a and a wizard and find community and catharsis. That's it was mm -hmm. all, a, you know, there's that part of me that goes like, uh, uh, I think you're exactly right. There's like a beautiful, very humanistic, reifying part of this game that allows you to find meaning in these stories. And again, it's very funny because like, listen, you know, ha the other half of the game is like, you know, nat ones and fart jokes and doing bits and silly stuff <laughs> yes, coming it up. Is. <laughs> and that's beautiful, right? Like life is crazy like that. Like, uh -huh. you know, I, I haven't done comedy for my entire life to sit here and talk about the importance of dignity. Like, no, it's there's tons of silly, wacky crap. Yes. But within the soil of that silly, wacky huh. crap, you find real genuine connection and mm -hmm. it, its importance and value can't be overstated. I think that's yeah. real as hell, man. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like I've I've had players just, you know, give me feedback before and they're just like, you know, Luke, I just want you to know that like the synopsis is there's a lot of things about my life that suck and being able to play D&D every couple of weeks is like it helps me so much in my life, you know, and when you have players tell you crap like that, you're like, oh, baby, that's what I'm talking about. Like, it's not just a game. This is something that's literally helping someone in their life in a demonstrable way, you know, and so, you know, you don't get those types of emails or anything too frequently. But when you do, you're just like, oh, OK, cool. Rock and roll. Let's yeah. do this, you know. No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And it's very cool too. Cause it's like, people do need that release. And I think that what's very special is like, there are a lot of types of like in, in, in a lot of media, there are types of release that I'm not even going to knock them. They're great, mm -hmm. but they are almost like soothing. Like when I get home after a long day, and I throw up something on Netflix or whatever mm -hmm. to watch. There is that thing sometimes of like, let me just get lost in a story. Yes. Let me watch, let me just like watch a documentary or watch, I don't know, Great British Baking Show. Something that's just gonna like, make me like soothe, <laughs> soothe for a second. Just be like, yes. look at these polite British people. I can calm down for an hour. Great, I'm all about it, right? Yeah. But what's nice about the release provided by D&D &D is, it's a type, it's almost the opposite in a healthy way where it's not passively consumed. It's mm -hmm. actually an act of creation. Yes. You need to be attentive. And and it's not about, you know, we like we all of us deal with so much stress and mm -hmm. work and everyone I know is overworked and underpaid and they got bills to pay and life is hard. And the ability to like, and I think there's something that a lot of media does, which is to just turn it off and zone out. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to knock that. There's a there's a use yeah. for that. Yeah. D and D is something else. It it takes that key from the from the stress position and flips it the other way right. and goes. You're active. You're present. You're creating something with people that mm -hmm. you like, that you think are funny and cool, and you want to tell a story with them. And you have a, the potential to be heroic here. Like you have the potential to do something um, uh, and experience making these choices mm -hmm. in first person. 
which, you know, not to get corny about it, but I think that there's a lot to be said for, I can point to LARPing and D&D in my own life and moments in my life that were either crises or where I needed to step up and act in a more moral or self-sacrificing way than was than is normal and could point to role-playing experiences and go oh man there there is a resonance in this story to what i'm going through in this moment that is making this easier because even though they're not first-hand lived experiences mm -hmm. stories do give us senses of that resonance of like, I've seen something like this before mm -hmm. and this hard moment is gonna get a little bit easier now. Yeah. Uh, so I'm all about it. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, how about we turn this over to Q&A and start pulling yeah. some questions from our chat. I see, I've been seeing lots of people asking lots of questions. We should probably take a look at this before they track us down and mob us. Ah. <clears throat> all right, here we go. So moderators. Uh, I see a bunch of blue highlights. I appreciate that. So first one, and I'm going to just field all, I mean, I'm going to have you field all of these if you wouldn't mind, sir. I might chime in too, but I'll mostly just let you, uh, you know, give us spot your wisdom. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so. Of course, of course. I'm happy to. <laughs> so <clears throat> Liana Silan says, do you ever have an actual meal as part of the scene so you can actually eat? And I think this, the context of this is probably LARPing. Oh, damn. Yeah. And LARPing for sure. Uh, for sure. For sure. Uh, we definitely had big old meals. Uh, that is that usually eats into the production budget a little bit. Um, uh, it's also very funny, depending on what kind of camp it is, because getting like me like it's expensive. If we were going to get like a whole roast suckling pig to yes. look like a big medieval yes. piece, I've been to a lot of like elven mead halls where it's like welcome travelers would you like some ritz crackers and craft singles <laughs> and you, you go like okay is this what was at the store down the road <laughs> or definitely uh, and often the answer is yes there are some physical limitations to larp um <laughs> uh but no having food is part of the scene definitely you can do i think even in D, &D you can do that a little bit too mm -hmm. um yeah. with some proper planning or whatever, if you want to do like a theme session. Uh, uh, tangent, unrelated, uh -huh. my uncle GA, who's uh, awesome, badass, uh, a, a, a real character of a guy. Uh, we used to do movie nights. We had a, we had an overhead projector at my old apartment in Gold Street uh -huh. in uh, uh, downtown Manhattan. And big old wall projector, had a great sound system. Uh, and he would come in costume and make meals from the time periods of badass old like <laughs> movies we would watch so he made like a cowboy stew when we watched like the good the bad and the ugly and then he made a whole like sushi roll thing for uh -huh. seven samurai and we did a um <laughs> we watched master and commander and he made sailor food like hard tack not yeah. the best meal we've ever had um but uh uh it was a, a great experience yeah use food to, to set the set the scene I mean, that's fun as hell yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah usually when we're playing D, D, the food we use to set the scene is pizza i mean and uh it's this beautiful thing that's not a problem exactly all right next question from travis d121 my combats as the dm always feel very bland how can i get better at tactics any advice or resources to help me get better tactics feeling bland as the dm right um so i think here what you want to look at is how to involve another axis within your combat right and what i mean by that is you're in a flat you know 10 square by 10 square room you drop a monster into the middle of it mm -hmm. the pcs are there you are completely reliant on those and on that monster's abilities, right? Right. And how do you avoid this becoming just just a uh, randomization exercise, right? Like, how do you prevent this just becoming like, mm. well, let's see who rolls better, right? Yeah. Like, it's it's a war of attrition. We got mm. we got a couple bags of hit points. Let's yep. see what the dice say. Um, 
that you in order to involve real strategy you want to be thinking about other axes of interaction you take the pcs and you take the monster mm -hmm. you have two axes right. you can only create two dimensional shapes if you add terrain into there all of a sudden you have a third axis and the degree of shapes you can create in that become way more vast and complex, right? Yep. Yeah, like displacer beasts have a fun ability. What would displacer beasts be like fighting in a fun house with mirrors everywhere, right? Or mm -hmm. if you're in a situation where you're fighting in a, you're up on a catwalk in a big industrial place, like mm -hmm. you're fighting in a forge and you're fighting creatures that are immune to fire damage in a giant smithy. How do you do that? Or you have an incredibly powerful monster, but in a terrain that advantages your player character. So you have a party of rogues, yeah. illusionist specialty wizards, and a giant monster that's just going to cream somebody in one hit, mm -hmm. but maybe it can't hit them or tell where they are, right? So you're, you're inviting terrain to make up a bigger component of what you're doing. An, a fourth axis, so you can create four dimensional shapes, is to think about non-combat priorities during combat. Mm. Now, Dimension 20 is a comedy show, so mm. we have a thing like this, but picture a battle with interesting PC abilities, interesting monsters and their abilities added to terrain, mm. and now there is a non-combat priority. Let's say mm. someone has a baby and the baby's asleep, and all of the monsters and PCs have agreed they don't want to wake the baby. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's, yeah. I know that seems silly. So suddenly everyone's making these stealth checks and if someone blows it, you maybe someone else can use their reaction to grant a reroll, like, shush, uh -huh. shush, right? Something like uh -huh. that. You add another element there. Um, a less silly version of that mm -hmm. might really simply be like, um, ritual disruption. So it's like, mm -hmm. okay, the bad guys are casting or doing a ritual spell. Mm -hmm. They're vastly more powerful, but if you, if you strategize just disrupting the ritual and escaping, you can get away with your life and it becomes quickly, you know, it's, it's apparent as blows start getting traded of like, oh, we need to rethink this combat. There's, this is, this is not a combat. This is us surviving combat while fulfilling a skill challenge. Mm -hmm. while hitting some kind of DC on some other kind of thing. So mm. I, th I think that a lot of ground can be covered thinking about terrain, yeah. thinking about non-combat priorities. I also think a great way to vary up your, your combats and games is strongly consider adding plot elements into combat. In other words, let's say you're running a dungeon crawl and you know that, uh, you know, there's like an ally character that needs to be introduced. There's a villain that needs to be introduced. Consider introducing them mid combat rather than having every combat almost, mm -hmm. you don't want to get into that fantasy, that final fantasy world map feel mm -hmm. of like, I'm walking and when a battle happens, it's just this fucking problem that I now have to handle that is literally arresting my progress towards my next goal, mm -hmm. right? Let's say a character meet their like long lost twin brother mid combat, have mm. them get unmasked halfway through round one and be like, you see your brother there. And you're like, my brother, clang, 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 clang. And it's like, cool, you can say one sentence and then it's not your turn anymore. Right. And then it's like, hey brother, great getting to know you. Clang, clang, I'll, I'll talk in one second. And then you're off onto the next part of the battle. Yeah. You know, you you include role playing in the combat mm. and, all, and mm -hmm. that does a couple of good things, which is one, it keeps people paying attention during combat where sometimes people can glaze over if it's not their turn. Mm -hmm. And number two, it makes people not believe reliably that they can check out during those. Mm -hmm. it, it makes them seem more significant and important. Yeah, than, than just like, oh, here's a f monster we got to fight. Okay, let's keep going. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, hell yeah. Yeah, I love the, I love the, the, the axis thing. Yeah, that's a good way. So I've, I, I've, I've had that idea that that's the thing you do, but I've never heard it expressed as adding a different axis to it, you know? And because and, because it impacts everything. Right? Yeah, but mm -hmm. I think the axis is like when you add that terrain or that environment axis. Now every single monster ability and every single PC ability is completely reinterpreted, right? Sh having the ability to use one of your attacks as a shove is a good part of 5e design. Shoves are useful. Yes. If you're fighting on an airship, 
man, shove mm -hmm. becomes a much bigger deal. Yes. And all of a sudden as a PC, maybe I would never go for enhance ability. I'm certainly gonna go for enhance ability now with the party barbarian. And I'm gonna go, hey, if you can just kick that ogre off the side of the ship, we can end this battle really quick, man. I'm gonna cast enhance ability, right? Like yeah. all of this synergy happens. But again, and that feels good to people because mm -hmm. it lets them go, oh, the incentive structure got changed. This new access got added. Yep. The shape of this battle's more complex. Oh yeah, totally, absolutely. Makes a huge difference. Ray Penis says, have you ever dressed up for a session? And I'm gonna assume this is just normal D&D, &D, not LARP, because LARP, obviously you have to kind of. <laughs> yes, for sure. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's bad if you're the one person in like sweats and Adidas <laughs> being like, I'm here to save the realm. Um, uh, but uh, honestly, that could be kind of fun. Um, uh, the, I would say the, the um, for D and D, not really. Um, I mean, I'm sure I have at some point, but not particularly. Here's the thing: as a larper, if I'm putting a costume on, I want to be larping. Mm -hmm. I am not a big like. Tr even truth be told, like I love Halloween for haunted houses and for you know scary movies and stuff like that. But I'm not the biggest costume person anymore because a little part of me gets sad to be mm. like oh man i'm having this incredible costume i'm doc ock look at these awesome arms and i got the goggles yeah. and now i'm gonna go to the bar down the street and maybe knock someone's drink out of their hand with my octopus tentacle and have to apologize and it's <laughs> awkward now well and it's, it's like, awkward oh. when you walk in and they're like why is this guy dressed up like doc ock man <laughs> it's just like, you know, even at a costume party, mm. I just look around and I'm going, I just go like, man, we should all be in character. <laughs> like that's yeah. just my, yes. I'm like, we should all, this, I want to know, like, like look over in a corner and see like, I dream of Jeannie with like Waldo from Where's Waldo talking to the Incredible Hulk. And it's like, that could be a great scene. Yeah. What are those three talking about? Or, um, or you show up as Doc Ock and then Spider-Man's over in the corner you know, and then he just comes right at you, you know, boom, <laughs> let's go. And you just get clocked in the face by Spider-Man. Exactly. That's the Halloween I want. You could have some um, sort of like silk food condiment or something, coleslaw or something. He's just like throwing it at you. It's like, ah, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's what I want. Um, so, no, I have never worn costumes at a D&D table before. Um, also, as the DM, like what costume would I, I would probably wear some kind of mysterious robe uh yeah. but no uh but if uh if it brings you joy more power to you I, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people that uh like that element of uh of, of the experience uh in which case i'm glad that it brings you joy yeah totally i i don't think i've ever dressed up for just a DD game either um yeah any advice for creating legendary actions and layer actions for creatures that do not already have them in their stat block? So this is like beefing up that solitary boss guy so it doesn't turn into a surround and pound or something. Yes, absolutely. Um, this is a great... Well, I, actually, that's a big clue right there, the surround and pound, is think about the powers that your PCs are likely to use on this thing. A lot of creatures have some kind of escape or movement legendary like vampires mm -hmm. straight up just have move as a legendary action mm -hmm. lot of very powerful high like high cr things have like a teleport or something like that a that's badass and b it makes a lot of sense because it can get you out of sticky situations yes. where suddenly you're just toast right um i think a what i would say is what PCs want from encounters with a legendary boss is the feeling of fighting you at your best. Dirty secret of DMs. PCs are always going to be more effective than just the stats explain. Like PC versus NPC, PC is gonna win even if the ACs and, and hit mm -hmm. points and proficiency bonuses are telling a different story. The reason is a PC 
has a deeper depth of knowledge about the optimization of their character and the tactics they employ mm. than any DM is going to have about any monster, mm -hmm. right? I've been playing this game for a long yep. time. I've had a lot of beholder fights. I do not know a beholder like the back of my hand in the way that someone knows their PC they've been playing for 20 sessions. And mm -hmm. that degree of shrewdness in their decision-making is always gonna make them way, way scarier. Now, that being said, what I think you want in your legendary action as a result of that is the feeling of something that can employ strategy. So I think what you want across legendary actions a lot of the time is a spread. Mm -hmm. Good legendary bad guy should have some area of effect thing. It should have some movement positioning related thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe it should have some kind of thing that throws a status effect on somebody and it should have its main ways of delivering damage, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, there's a lot to be said about that. Number one, it makes a battle feel more, like have more variety, right? Like, you know, dragons are probably one of the best designed monsters in the game because they have the breath and it's the area of effect, which makes your PCs do cool stuff. Like say, don't, don't all stand in a line, like scatter, scatter, right? Uh, which is fun. It makes mm -hmm. you feel like they're on the run from something big and scary and powerful. Yeah. Um, and I think again, you, the whole fun of legendary actions is your creature will actually get to use different cards in its hand a couple times. Like again, spoiler alert, very few monsters, even very cool ones, are gonna be able to do more than three or four things. Yeah, battles, just, battles yeah. the, the median battle lasts yeah. four rounds, right? Yeah. Um, so that being said, if your monster has five abilities, you're one of them you're never gonna see, right? Mm -hmm. um, unless you have legendary actions, which means that this monster can throw them out all over the place. Right. So I think spell casting is always a great one to consider. Um, and I think you do you want that feeling of like tricks up the sleeve, right? It's that it's that clever girl vibe from the Velociraptors in uh, Jurassic Park, where if this monster goes on its turn and it's like claw, claw, bite, tail, mm -hmm. big load of damage gets done to somebody, the next thing that it does should be vanish with a cackle and suddenly it's gone. And you're like, <laughs> oh shit, you know, yes. where'd it go? Yeah. Um, the next thing it does should be, you know, like spawn some weird minion creature or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like it just does something that, that basically. Yes. It, it adds that element, because think about it, like how long do battles take? If, you're, if your monster only has one turn per round mm -hmm. and you have six players, that monster is probably gonna do something and then not do another thing for 45 minutes, right? <laughs> if it takes that long, yeah, some groups yeah. might, dang. Yeah, yeah that's, that can suck. It feels yes. like the monster's not even this. If the monster's yes. like, I'm gonna go get coffee, you guys let me know when right. you're done torching me, you know, like. Yep. Um, so the, the nice thing about legendary actions is it makes the monster monster a constant presence yes. in the fight. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, which means if you give it a big variety of abilities, yeah. it means that every 15 minutes it does something new that makes everyone go like, oh God, you know, prepare for this, which mm -hmm. is just a great way of keeping your players scared. Yeah, we need to, after this conversation, we got to go into how to speed the game up because 15 minutes for a player to take their turn, dude, I would be like, shoot me now. <laughs> no way, dude. Yeah, um, I, I love, so like basically the essence of like a lot of this stuff distilled down what you just said was variety so that a combat is not static in so much that the monster does the exact same thing every single time, but it is dynamic and it makes the battle more interesting and fun because something new is constantly happening and the players have to adapt and react to it. And so, yeah, and that's going to make the battle so much more fun. And that that's true for legendary. That's true for any battle. If the monster, if all the monster does is walk in the middle of the room and claw, claw, bite, take damage, claw, claw, bite, take damage that's just gonna be like okay four rounds of this sigh yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure i yeah. mean absolutely right um i think another thing there too is um uh, uh another another axis we can kind of add well first of all also with layer action specifically that mm. goes right back into environment right yeah um I think adding a huge risk factor is great. A crumbling cavern, a, a, a haunted weird tomb area, right? With ghosts doing stuff. Um, it's great if that stuff does damage. It's also great if you get, remember 
anything you describe, PCs are gonna wanna interact with. Mm -hmm. So if you describe that something is crumbling, get ready for the wizard to throw a fireball at the roof and be like, I wanna bring the roof down on this thing. Yes. Yep. And be prepared to either plan a system for allowing that or get good at improvising. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, but I would say too that like, um, one thing also to keep in mind is, is another access you can add is the monster's motivation, mm -hmm. right? Um, if, if you have monsters that have differing motivations, uh, uh, or like, obviously there are a lot of low level monsters that don't have any other ability other than deal damage, yeah. right? You know, goblins and things like that. But the difference is those things are smart and they can have a different motivation. Like think of a battle with one big troll coming in and just clobbering and goblins are attacking as well, but it immediately becomes clear that the goblins are trying to kidnap one person. Mm, mm -hmm. That is going to change and suddenly you go, oh, there's a different thing at work here, right? Yeah. Um, monster <clears throat> motivation is a whole other thing you can add mm -hmm. to make those battles very different where yes, it's still dealing damage every turn, but you can clock it in a very different way. And the flip side of that is doing something like, yeah, a griffin is attacking you give the opportunity for the druid to do a survival or an insight check and be like, this thing is a beast. It's defending its nest. The barbarian is standing too close to an egg mm -hmm. and like just move back, right? And that gives a fun non-combat way to resolve that encounter uh, that also gets you out of that path of just like yes. damage, 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 damage. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, there's so much we could talk about on improving encounters and combats, dude. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's like, it's the part of the game too that many times takes up the majority of the time in the game so it's like if you're going to spend like my games have a balance of like social interactions exploration and combat but combat is that's like for me at least when i'm running my game that's like the meat of dnd it's like 90 percent of the book is about combat and crap my character sheet's about combat so we're gonna have some combat so it's like if you're going to have a good segment of your game that that it revolves around combat then let's think of ways to make combat more fun and interesting and not just like walk into the room and it's a it's a battle of math who can win this math contest you know what i mean so yeah so all right let's 100 percent. let's hit another question here any advice on getting into larping if you've never participated um, well, if you are, uh, uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, depending on what age you are, uh, if you're a kid, check out the Wayfinder Experience, my old LARP summer camp. Um, if you're not a kid, uh, I would say, um, just if Google, like in the area around you, there are a lot of hobbyist LARPers. I would guarantee that there's a community near you of people that are interested. And there's a lot of variety within LARP as well. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, like people that are doing like vampire and mage and like different sort of like, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. There's people that are also doing stuff like Society for Creative Anachronism, right? Mm -hmm. Or like even more intense than that is like people doing, I mean, this is not really LARPing, but no. like doing like, you know, historical European martial arts. For people that do LARPing, I would say there's some really indie stuff that's like very much a um how to describe it like th there's some this very indie stuff that's like very role play heavy there's some really like abstract european you know like i've there, i've heard of larps where it's like each it's like weren't like larps that are like a werner herzog documentary where it's like each of you is role playing as a worm who is learning uh, self-loathing and you're like mm, i'm not sure about this but if that's your cup of tea, it's out there. Um, uh, so I would say uh, uh, research around you. Uh, yeah. LARPs are vast and many. There's also like big tourist ones. Like there's mm -hmm. one that runs out of a castle in Poland where you mm -hmm. like you know, drop some crazy amount of cash, but then you're like, you have a ticket to Poland and you go live in a castle and LARP there for oh, two weeks. Oh, that sounds like fun, man. Day. Yeah, 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 yeah. I need to do that stuff. <laughs> All right. Next one from Emirs. I'm currently running a campaign. The players hit level six, and I want to throw some monsters at them that they might not be able to handle. They might be able to handle, but I'm not 100% sure as to how the difficulty rating scales and if the monsters I want to use for the counter are too high or how do I lower the CR, but use the same monsters. Wow. All right, man. Can you do something with that? Let me tell you, I'm gonna tell you something right now. You want me to tell you something right now? I'm gonna tell you something right now. Challenge rating is nothing. 
do not do not consult challenge rating. I dropped a either I think it was I forget I forget how five E does the age denominations. I dropped a challenge rating twenty mm-hmm. plus red dragon on a group of six eighth level yeah. adventurers, many of whom were at half hit points and like half spell slots. <laughs> um, and they almost wiped the floor with it. If they had oh, been at man. full health and full spell slots, oh, would have been geez. toast. Done deal. Easy. Challenge rating, uh-huh. I, with all love and respect to the incredible designers, uh, <laughs> challenge rating is y- useless. It is yeah. useless. Um, uh, you know, again, all the love and respect, but I don't, and, and again, mm-hmm. I don't know that it would be easy to ever get challenge rating right. Um, the yeah. truth is, mm-hmm. and uh, the other side is this, there are monsters that are like, you know, CR 10 or around there that could absolutely decimate a party. Mm-hmm. There just aren't, mm-hmm. the things are not weighted. If you have a monster yeah. that has some kind of like high DC stun effect, you could, oh. The Alkalith. The, yeah, oh, the Alkalith, baby. Done. Dude, dude, Done. dude, I put that up against my one of my groups, all right? And they, I had no idea that this was going to go down. I'm like, the confusion effect, dude. They're all just like, well, I'm confused. I can't do anything. Well, we can't do anything. We can't do anything. And I'm just like, kill, 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 kill. Every, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh. That thing was insane. It's like a CR-10 or something. They were like... I think they were like level six or something, but there were like five of them. And so I'm like, you could handle a CR 10 at level six and there are five of you. It's similar to your ancient dragon example. No, man, they were getting decimated. It was, it was, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, so, so what I would say to you is like, you, you use your best judgment. I mean, like, yeah, you can eyeball using the chart that CR has laid out in front of you. Mm -hmm. My experience is, and also I think the other thing is this, player optimization is a huge factor. It's a huge factor. If you have yes. if you have a group of players that are playing for their first time, I, t- true story, I actually think if you took a group of six veteran D&D players and gave them second level characters and put them up against people playing for the first time playing fifth level characters, a uh, group of second levels wins. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, for huh. sure. Like it's 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 a huge factor. So it, it depends on who your players are. It depends on yeah. how canny they are. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, now the question was related to like how to scale down higher CR monsters, right? Yeah. Is that yeah. sort of? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean like, well, what's interesting about this is to what degree of balance you keep things the same, right? Because the factors that go into challenge rating have to do with mathematics between a creature's AC, its hit points, its average damage output, mm-hmm. and the DCs of its like save abilities, right? right. Um, what's interesting is in a, in a lot of situations, monsters kind of scale all of these things together mm-hmm. with some exceptions. Like obviously some things have a higher AC and a lower whatever damage output, yada, yada. But if you, I, my suspicion is you could really break the game if you tweaked that too much, right? Like if you made something with an AC of 30 and then gave it mm. 20 hit points or something, you know what I mean? Like you could yeah. really mess the yep. game up by getting those things too far out of alignment. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah. Uh, but again, I would say like, okay, here's a dumb analogy. Here's ready, ready for this. This is dumb. There's a reason that the people you know in your life that are really, really great at cooking often don't need to carefully measure every single thing that's going in there, right? That needs to be your goal as a dungeon master is to get Mm -hmm. to the point where you're kind of eyeballing it. You're going like, have they had a long rest? Have they had a short rest? How has this party done against monsters similar to this in the past? Do they make the optimal choices mm-hmm. against big, strong <clears throat> monsters? What about spell casters, right? Spell casters are a very different story. And again, all this, all this stuff is different because, you know, you can't get around the differences in these abilities. A spell caster fight, t- generally speaking, goes one of two ways really bad for the PCs or that dude is dead on round one. Uh, yes. Oh man. <laughs> yes. I've had so many. Sp- I ha- I recently had a spellcaster battle 
where the, I was mopping my players up with this guy, like because of the terrain and different things that were going on, they couldn't get near him, right? And he had, well, first of all, he had greater invisibility on too, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm just like fireball, fireball, cone of coal. I'm just, they're just getting annihilated, you know, they could get near him, right. but, but he had 30 hit points. So the moment they get near him and can actually hit him, he's toast. You know, I, they just couldn't get near him, you know. Yeah. And that's something to bear in mind, too, that's very funny, which is from a bird's eye perspective, a dungeon master's perspective, mm. we know that the difference between the spellcaster fight and the dragon fight are not that different because we're going like, you know, like spellcaster's going to survive for four rounds. Dragon's going to survive for four rounds. It's all groovy. But mm. the players have a very different experience because when players are hitting that giant meat wall, they're yeah. like, they're getting their ass kicked, but they're like, we're making progress, yes. gang. <laughs> like, like, don't lose the faith, you know? Like, uh, but with that spellcaster, even <laughs> though you, the DM, know it's a one hit kill, yeah. the round after round that they're like, God, dude, where is this guy? Dude. Are going to drive them way more crazy. Yes, uh, and it, it, and it was it was beautiful too because very rarely does do my spellcasters actually manage to like make a good show for their money, like actually do something. Because like I've had so many spellcasters where it's just like, oh, they ran up to him and they started, oh crap, do I have misty misty step or anything? Nothing. I got nothing. I'm dead. Okay, it's over. You know what I mean? Uh, one of the things too, one of the things too, we were talking about the CR challenge rating and stuff and adjusting it is uh, another dirty dungeon master secret is changing things on the fly. Like, okay, so you rolled in with the Alkalith that is about to TPK everybody. Now, this is also what you were saying about LARPing is the final boss battle might not be known whether you're going to win or lose, but everything leading up to that, it's kind of like, yeah, we're going to get there. When you're running D&D, it's like, if you go, if you get to the final boss battle and you fight against it and you lose, like, okay, we lost. But if you get to like a mook, that's not even the final boss guy and you just get annihilated, there's something very unsatisfying about that, you know? So it's like this Alkalith was not the final boss. This is just some dude on the way. It's just like not a big deal. And it turned into a big deal. So like the dirty secret is, okay, great. So now you need to adjust it on the fly. It's like, I could have changed anything about this monster before that battle ever began. So now that the battle is actually in flight, what's the difference ostensibly between my changing it now? And the players don't see that. From the player's point of view, it's like even Steven, you know, so. This is this is what you are, are just describing here is I think the biggest message that DMs need to receive in their mm. understanding of the game. There is a weird, and I don't know that most people would even would even be able to articulate it, but we mm. all know in our hearts that it's here, which is mm. this subtle bias that all D&D players have that prioritizes prep work over improv at mm. the table mm -hmm. in terms of legitimacy. Yes. And it's baloney. Yes. It's all equally legitimate. It's all equally legitimate, and it's but it's a weird thing. I had a, I had a, a friend of mine one time ask me to my face, being like, "That thing that happened, you know, did that? Did you plan that ahead of time?" Mm. And I was, and I remember going like, I, when I said like, "Well, hey, I don't necessarily like I mean, magician never tells the secrets or whatever," but I was like, <laughs> I was like, and I kind of said like, "Well, listen, I am the authority in this setting mm -hmm. while I'm at the table, mm -hmm. and when I'm doing prep work." Mm -hmm. So why would that choice have mattered less if I improvised it? Like, mm -hmm. why? Like, listen, the prep work I did for this was like in my underwear eating Chips Ahoy last Friday night on a sofa. Why does that have so much legitimacy yes. to you? That like, <laughs> wow, this was prepared. It's like, relax, it's right. fine, I'm a guy. But there's mm -hmm. this funny thing where people really do Yes. give that a kind of like halo around mm. it and i think it's malarkey i don't think yes. it's i don't think it's warranted because what you're saying is exactly mm. right if you have the authority to adjust the alkalith's hit points mm -hmm. on friday night when you were doing your prep work you have the authority to adjust it right now mm -hmm. and again probably should anyone this is not comparable to something like fudging a die roll which is mm -hmm. like this is, because what this is is it's you going to me, why I feel uh, deputized to make that call in the moment is mm -hmm. 
I have clearly made an error as a dungeon master. Mm -hmm. I won't apologize for, for rough rolls. Like if I have an enemy who's hit like four crits on these PCs, that's bad luck. They can live with that. But if there's something where like, oh, I misapprehended mm -hmm. how difficult this monster was gonna be, just like a referee making a good call in a game, I yeah. need to make the good call now to address this because right. this is not player error. This right. is error on my part. Yes, I'm. An, it's incumbent on me to make an adjustment in the moment um, uh, to fix that. I, so I think, yeah. Yeah, totally agree. In fact, like it, when I think about the number of TPKs I've had and when the TPKs happen, the TPKs have always thus far come from player error. Like there were, the situation had been planned. They made a very bad error and they should have known better. And then when it's all unfolding, Luke is like, OK, they're going to all die. And it's their own fault because X, Y and Z. Therefore, I'm not changing anything. We're going to go through with this and you guys. Are, and then afterward, there's going to be a debrief and they're going to be like, yeah. So remember when we turned the undead and those undead went running off because we turned them and then we kept going through the dungeon and we heard the undead after it had worn off following us. You know, we probably should have not kept on going. We probably should have turned around and dealt with them. But we didn't, and then we ran into this crazy monster that's super hard, and then the undead cut up with us, and we got sandwiched, and it was all over there. At that point, you know, as a dungeon master, I'm just like, I gave you so many warnings you knew, and you decided not to, and now it's, I'm not, I'm not pulling back, you know, I'm not intentionally killing you, but if you die, you die, because you should have known better. You know, but when it's when it's my error, when it's when I put the stupid alkalith there and had no idea that it was this bad, then it's just like, OK, now I feel like I need to do something, you know, um, whereas if they had been warned over and over and stuff and they were like, ah, whatever, we don't care. Then it's like, OK, that's more on you, you know, so I, I, I for me, I feel there's a difference. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I think that's absolutely it. And I think that's also speaks well to your players as well, because the thing is this, right? As a dungeon master, you have a huge burden on yourself because you're the rules adjudicator, mm -hmm. but you're also playing the antagonist, right? Mm -hmm. This is almost would be like if the ref was playing on the right. opposing team, yes. right? Or maybe a better analogy is if the ref was the coach of the other team, right? Yeah. And so you're kind of like, <laughs> kind of like, okay, we like, so you gotta be really fair in mm -hmm. your calls, right? So you want your players to be having a reaction like that, like what Luke just said of like having the reaction of, Oh, I see how that was on us. Yes. Um, which means that again, when you have that alkalith roll in, like it's even more incumbent in that moment to be like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix this on the fly because a TPK rolling into your party when they really don't have a tactical error to point to mm -hmm. feels raw as hell. Yeah. And and there can be that abuse. It's obviously, it's not as severe as like, uh, LOL, rocks fall, everybody dies. It's so but, bad. <laughs> but there is that element that we have uh -huh. to do well to avoid to yeah. maintain trust. Because again, just like having the ref be the coach of the enemy team, mm -hmm. that only works with a lot of trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. My my Curse of Strahd group right now, we, we ended our last game session in like what looked to be the middle of a TPK. You know, there's like, th I think three people are down, two people are up, and the, the guy is just like, stab, stab, you're down, stab, stab, you're down. He's just like cutting a swath of destruction through them. And then we ended the game session there. They were like, why? No. And I'm like, yeah, it's nine o'clock, dude. We're ending. <laughs> so. Ah, but, but oh, my that, God. But I had one of my I, one of my players of that game said multiple times. He's like, look, you guys, we're level six now. This is Curse of Strahd. Why haven't we died yet? You know what I mean? And so now, <laughs> now once it happens, you know, then I mean, I'll jokingly, you know, be like, well, Joe, it's because you kept on saying that. <laughs> Well, that's a wild thing. You know, it's funny in the in the the, uh, the long. So I've had PC deaths pretty mm -hmm. frequently. Never a TPK. Yeah. Closest we came to a TPK was we had a total party defeat. Okay. Which was a raw raw thing where mm -hmm. it was a, a a situation where the PCs were more valuable alive than dead, basically, yeah. and yep. only one of them like escaped off into the woods. But again, it's like you want in those situations the ability for the players to failure i mean this is like an overarching note for like 
how do you incorporate failure and despair when, as we've said, the point of these games is to be these epic badass heroes, right? Mm -hmm. Because you got to have failure to make success matter. But it's also, if it, no one's going to keep coming to a game where they just get stomped every week. Yes. So there's this interesting thing of like how you incorporate that. Mm -hmm. And I think that the thing that people can love about D&D is that failure is failure when they know there's a lesson from it, mm -hmm. when they think that it's part of their agency. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Like w when a massive failure comes around and the players immediately know it's because of the actions they took, they're, they might have like, oh God, that like gut wrenching thing, but they're still weirdly having a good time. It's mm -hmm. like twisting them up inside, but they're like, yeah. no, what did we do? Yes. They're engaged. Yeah. If they if they have a catastrophic failure and they feel like it was inflicted on mm. them, you will watch them go like stone face. They'll be yeah. like, mm. they're like, this mm. this is mm -hmm. not fair. This is not earned. Yes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. And and I think too that like that goes from moment to moment. I think that as a DM, one of the big tricks you have to learn is how to handle failure, even in that moment to moment thing. Like when a player mm. rolls low. Uh, a, or a player like messes. I think one of the, one of the things that is an easy, like easy winner for ruining a player's good time is if their character fails at something they're supposed to be good at, right? Like mm -hmm. wizard just absolutely whiffs on an important arcana check, and then the barbarian hits it. It's like and the what? barbarian hits Come the net. On. <laughs> So stupid. So Man. stupid. Hilarious, but <laughs> but so so stupid. And I think in that, that's a moment as a DM to help massage failure a little bit into because the thing is, failure doesn't. As we've said before, mm -hmm. failure doesn't feel bad when it confirms player agency. If you have a catastrophic defeat, but it was because of the actions you took, mm -hmm. you get to still feel like you're in control. You're like, oh, I made a mistake. Yeah, and that's why bad things happen. I like, think about real life mistakes you like like what the thing that's always horrifying is what if i'm just at the mercy of the world and bad things happen to me for no reason right like mm -hmm. people want to avoid that feeling in their games yeah on a on a moment to moment level if that wizard whiffs that arcana check it's about using the failure to still confirm their identity so it's something as simple as like you know if the wizard is like a very bookish academic nerdy type you can say something like you know like oh you saw this thing in a chapter of a book but um it was due at the library that day and you've vowed never to incur a late library fee so you return the book without reading that section and then the failure is still there but the wizard is like ha ah, i knew i should have gotten back on the wait list for that book and it's like it confer it's like Yes, you failed at this thing, but you're still who you think you are. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I totally like when you were talking about failure being necessary for victory to be felt and like actually. So like, uh, I, I definitely feel that that's so super important. Like if there is no fail state, there's not really any victory state either. Like if 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 death is not a possibility, if my character dying is not a possibility, you know, then what's the victory what does it mean when i defeated the monster it's meaningless if there's never any pc death if there's maybe never ever possibly a tpk like if your players if your players believe that you as the dungeon master are going to save their bacon every single time then every they're just more like ah they're just cavalier about it it's like ah what's the big deal it's like we never get killed around here or anything you know but it's like it's like they need to believe that you as the dungeon master are capable of going through with it, you know, and it's an illusion. It's like it's like smoke and mirrors, you know, like because we want them to have fun. And ultimately, you know, they're probably going to win, but they need to believe at some level that defeat is a possibility so that victory can have flavor. Otherwise, it's just bland and meaningless, you know, so. A hundred percent. And I think that's very true, too, because there is a balance there, because obviously it's like, I, I'm not, I don't have a great poker face. My players mm -hmm. know that I'm rooting for them. I want the heroes of the story to win. But what is true is that <clears throat> I have to communicate to them that I am going to be an impartial enforcer of the mm -hmm. laws of consequence, right? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that I get harsher the more glib my players get. And what I mean by that is mm. when my players are taking threats 
very, very seriously. And they're taking risks very, very seriously. And they clearly are feeling the impression of the dangerous world. Yeah. I'm more likely to, maybe the right word is negotiate with them around like them being like, oh my God, like, like, I failed my last death save and another character's like, mm -hmm. wait, I have a reaction to 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 allow a reroll. Could I do that for a death save? I'm mm -hmm. way more likely if mm -hmm. they've been feeling the weight of the world to be like, for sure, you can use your reaction, mm -hmm. reroll that death save. Mm -hmm. If players on the other hand are like, whatever, I walk up to the pirate captain and I spit in his drink. You bet, and and I can tell <laughs> that they are feeling the simulation too yeah, much. Yeah. Like like things are becoming a little bit too cardboard. Uh -huh. Guaranteed, that's when it's like, cool. You take eighty seven points of damage. Um, everyone roll initiative. <laughs> you know, like that, does that make like I yeah, know it's kind of funny. Yeah. There is there is uh -huh. like an inverse relationship. Sure. Like uh -huh. I don't feel the need to police that boundary when I can tell that the players are honoring it a lot themselves. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, let's hit another one here. Um, Estrogen says, how about how much of your Dimension 20 DMing is improvised? Ooh, that's a fascinating thing. So obviously Dimension 20, we have pre-built sets and minis, which need to be made weeks and months in advance. We have Rick Perry, who's our awesome set builder, who's dope as hell. So for our big main campaigns, we do often have big set pieces made ahead of time. But the truth is that the vast bulk of what I try to do is improv. Um, uh, I would say that like, the, there's a I forget the quote, but there's a great old quote of like, plans are useless, planning is essential, right? Mm -hmm. Of like, I write a storyline for the campaign with the understanding that that is there mostly to get thrown away as PCs have awesome reactions to things, fall in love, make mm -hmm. enemies, move through the world, get up to interesting shenanigans. And mm -hmm. again, it's like, for me, it's always about how much can we put the PCs at the center of this world and honor their choices. Um, uh, but again, I would say that the, the working relationship is the big tent poles are pre-planned. The battle sets that Rick is gonna make, I know who the PCs are in advance. I know who the big bad is gonna be in advance. Mm -hmm. There are certain enemies and, and uh, like having a rich world often means knowing what events are already in motion. You don't, you, like one of the problems with um, with sandbox style play, this is a, we sort of come full circle, mm -hmm. talking about railroading earlier, one of the big problems with sandbox style play is that sandbox worlds aren't fun if they're not dynamic. Too many s DMs heading mm -hmm. into their first sandbox style game just go, here's the world, what do you want to do? But in reality, when you look at your, the, like, for example, the real world mm -hmm. is a sandbox. You can go anywhere, you can move to a new city, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. But, but I'm not a sandbox. Like I have family, mm -hmm. I know who I care about. I have dreams and wishes and ambitions. And also, so does everyone else. Like no matter who you were in 2020, you were interacting with COVID to some degree. There was something happening in the world. So in your fantasy world, if you're gonna do sandbox style play, um, you are going to want some degree of preparation of like, here are the big plots and schemes going on in mm -hmm. the world that are creating ripples that my PCs can become aware of. Yeah. Um, all of that being said, as much as possible, it's a micro macro thing. The macro is pre-planned and I try to keep the micro as free from scripting as possible, mm -hmm. to leave as much up to the PCs and as much up to improvisation as I can to maximally honor PC choices and allow them to influence not only things about you know their characters, but to influence reactions from the world and changing, you know, one of the most mm -hmm. fun bits of world design, we're, we're currently airing season two of The Unsleeping City, which is our sort of urban fantasy New York game. Mm -hmm. um, one of the best parts of the world building was how the world reacted to the actions of the PCs in the first season mm -hmm. and be and, and getting to be like, no, no, like the world is shaped by you guys too. And, we're, and I'm gonna show that. So I think being able to do that in the moment with improv is is critical. So I think improv yeah. plays a huge part of, of what mm -hmm. I like to bring to the table as a dungeon master. Yeah, and, and what you mentioned about <clears throat> the world being shaped by the decisions that the cast members or the players made, you know, in the first season, 
that's huge too because that gives the players this feeling that their decisions their actions actually matter in the game world like what i decide to do could change things and shape things it's not just and, and that's where that like where we the sense of railroad departs because a railroad is no matter what i do we know that it's it's a foregone conclusion that x is going to happen i cannot influence the game world my actions and decisions don't matter you know but when they do matter and you're literally changing the game world and things are happening because they decided x thing you know then they feel like oh oh okay now like i'm actually on center stage and what i do has it makes a big difference when the dungeon master is doing things to have the world or or players in the world and PCs and stuff react to them, you know, and, and that takes a game to a whole different level, you know, and, and it's much more enjoyable for sure. I totally, totally agree. That's that. Those are the kind of games that I want to play in. So, the, and I think, you know, that's for DMs. It's like, what's the kind of game you would want to play in? Hopefully that's the mm -hmm. kind of game you're running. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right, here we go. Next question. How often do you let players dictate the frame of scenes versus when you frame the scene yourself. Has streaming your games affected this ratio? Interesting. So I'm gonna take the idea of framing scenes here to kind of mean like setting the parameters for mm -hmm. them in a way. Yeah. Um, I obviously do the lion's share of that as the dungeon master, mm -hmm. because I think that those delineations are really helpful for people. Um, and also, I'll be honest, when I'm playing a character, I very much do not want to be responsible for setting the scene because I <laughs> am, what I get out of being a player mm -hmm. is not, um, I, I've said this before a couple of times, mm -hmm. but to me, being a DM and being a PC are you're almost playing two different games mm -hmm. because the the itch that I'm scratching as a DM is very similar to what I'm getting as a writer, which is like imagination. Like yep. what can I come up with? Yep. The, the itch that I'm scratching as a PC is much more similar to the itch that you scratch as an actor, which is more about immersion. It's, mm -hmm. it's not that imagination plays no part of it, but it really is like, I am trying to get lost in this character. Yeah. I am, I, I am trying to get as first person as possible. I mm. want to feel what they're feeling. I want to have the experience of victory, the tragedy of failure. I want to feel the delight of treasure and adventure and a new, exciting, fantastical world, mm. all from the, the eyes of the character, um, which can be difficult if I am also responsible kind of for like, the storytelling apparatus on top of them. Like yeah. if I have to play my PC, but also be like, yeah, and a bad thing happens to me because this is mm -hmm. the break into the third act. Like, yeah. I don't want to be responsible for that. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I think that I do the lion's share of the, the framing of scenes. That being said, I love when PCs call for scenes. That honestly mm. is a is a milestone that I wait for, knowing that I've gotten comfortable enough with a group of players. When a player can look up and be like, and I think some players get very shy about this because they're worried that they're like hogging the spotlight. Mm -hmm. But it's so great when it happens. When a player goes like, hey, can I go back to the tavern and talk to that young like serving person mm -hmm. who who got like accosted by that like king's guard? Mm -hmm. I want to go talk to them and tell them that we're gonna go beat that guy up and they don't have to worry. Like mm. I love when PCs go like I'm I want to yeah. interact with the world. I want to initiate a scene. So yes. I love when PCs ask for scenes and mm. specifically go mm. like, I would like to go initiate an interaction of some kind. Because yeah. again, if you were watching a movie where the main characters never took action, you would be like, this movie sucks. Yeah. D&D campaigns are no, no different. You want mm. to, as much as you need to give a plot hook, DMs honestly are looking for the PCs to be the one to say, well, we have the gem, we need to go to the tomb of so-and-so rather than constantly having the NPC ranger be like, hey guys, remember that gem you got? Probably oh, time geez. to bring that to the tomb, don't you think? You know, it's so interesting. You're making these examples right now. And like <clears throat> in my games, it's like, I expect 
my players to do the latter. Like, like or the where they frame it themselves, where they say, hey, we're going to go do this thing. We're going to take the gem back. What's the next? Like right now in Curse of Strahd, it's like they have about eight different plot hooks that I've given them. I don't care which one they do, but they need to decide what they're going to do. And they're in Valaki. They need to decide how they're going to deal with this big political situation I just laid out. It's on them. So like, they decide where they go and what they do and what their actions are, you know, and then I'm going to obviously improvise the game world in response. But it's like, for me, like I kind of like want my if my players don't do that, I'm not going to hold their hands like I'm probably going to stare at them and be like, they're going to talk, 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 talk. And then nothing they don't. Do, and I'll just be like, OK, guys, what are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you I'm not going to I'm not going to be like, OK, you all get on your horses and ride to the tomb where, you know, you have to recover the stolen gem. Like, I'm not going to tell them I'm, that's like to me, that's just that's that's just taking their agency away. Now, I will do that for a one shot because I want to frame the situation, get them in the action because we only have four hours to play. That's a totally different story. But for an ongoing campaign, most of the time, I'm, I don't talk a whole lot. I'm just sitting here listening to my players. They're talking among themselves. They're deciding what they're going to do. I'll describe a scene or a situation. And then they're, you know what I mean? So it's like, I feel like that for, is, it almost feels like you're, what you're saying is right. That's where you want to get to. That's where you want to be because then the game just gets so much better and your players are running the show in a, in a larger way and they feel like, yeah, so. A million percent. And I think you're absolutely right that the only time that ever gets abridged, like occasionally doing streaming where there's time considerations, mm -hmm. I, sometimes I will be like, I forget the, the guy's name. It's like Robert's Rules of Orders. I'll occasionally mm -hmm. be the person like keeping minutes where I'll be like, yeah. It seems like everyone wants to go to the mountains of chaos. Yes. Do we have quorum? Like yes. occasionally I will be that person just mm -hmm. because as a producer, I got my eyes on the clock. Exactly. But in a home game, I am much more likely just to be like, hey, you guys talk it out as long as you want. I'm only going to interrupt if the innkeeper says everyone's going to bed. We need to turn off the candles <laughs> down here. Like, you know, you yeah. guys tell me. Uh, or, totally. if I, yeah, or if I get bored and something attacks them. Yeah, because they just talk too long. Yeah, something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell yeah. All right. Beautiful. Um, do you give players a benefit for having proficiency in a skill check? For example, can a player without medicine proficiency stabilize a downed player? So how do you roll can proficiency level proficiency stuff? So like for Please. So like, yeah. for instance, well, the first part of the question is, do you give players a benefit for having a proficiency in the skill check? Yeah, that's the plus two or plus three they get. But I think the real question is, um, if a player does not have, for instance, if a barbarian wants to know how a spell works, but he's not proficient in arcana, can he attempt it? Or is it like, no, you need to have proficiency? That's interesting. So 3.5, which is the last edition I played before mm -hmm. moving to 5e, had those systems for things that you were allowed to attempt untrained mm -hmm. versus things you were not allowed yes. to attempt untrained. Yep. Um, uh, which I kind of, I do dig the theory behind that. Mm -hmm. And I think that like where I come down on that is it, it, this is gonna be a cop-out answer, my apologies. It depends on the genre of the game you're playing. Mm -hmm. If, honestly, if I was running Strahd, I would be way less likely to let someone make an untrained skill check because the whole point is that this is gothic and horrifying and scary. If someone has some weird bleeding wound from some nasty wolf that ran out of the forest line, I'm not gonna let some untrained schmo like mm -hmm. the barbarian who's got like a, a you know a flat mm -hmm. 10 wisdom jam his thumb in the open wound and be like am i fixing it um but in something that's a lot more low-key or a lot more like hey it's just very high fantasy it's very classic like the rules as written like here's the thing i think the rules is written let you do that like if you because i what is it the dc for stabilizing with a medicine check is like 10, 10 right? dude it's dumb yeah I upped it to 15. It, we had a very a high lethality, mm -hmm. like Game of Thrones style mm -hmm. season. Mm -hmm. And I upped it to 15 specifically. And I think I had a rule, like if you fail by 10 or more, you add another death save failure. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, Ooh. yeah, don't do untrained surgery on people. <laughs> that's a bad call. I love um, it. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that's that's how you get people hurt. That's how you get gangrene. Don't do that. Um, uh -huh. But I do think that there is an element of like, um, how do you put it? Yeah, I would say like, 
it, the, the reason I, I say genre is like, in a very fantastical, we've all got magic, mm -hmm. high on likelihood anyone's gonna die, we're all just having a fun time. Yeah. Lo you know, like Lost Minds of Fandelver or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, fine, make an untrained medicine check. And again, that is rules as written. If you wanna be a stickler for the rules as written, Correct. you're allowed to do that. Yeah. If you want any kind of really serious stakes or gravity, mm -hmm. that is one of the first couple of homebrew rules. Yep. I would consider introducing 100%. right yeah um uh is something is upping the dc of stabilizing and of having those things and be like uh, you know here's what you and then it's handle it how you want i could definitely see a world where it's like um i think you can make calls specifically you can be like look medicine and arcana are more complicated than than something like persuasion they just sure, are absolutely they just have more specialized lore mm -hmm. you need to be trained to make those checks or if that mm -hmm. if that feels overly like nitpicky to you mm -hmm. you can even just do something where it's like you know um maybe there's some benefit bigger benefit to having a proficiency in those things where it's mm -hmm. like hey if you have proficiency in medicine or whatever these checks become even more trivial or something mm -hmm. along the lines of like add add five to the difficulty if someone does like maybe it's something if you have like if you're doing an arcana check you're like when i give you a dc that's the dc for if you have proficiency if you don't have proficiency that dc bumps by five something like that you know like right. whatever <clears throat> whatever way you want to address it i think mm -hmm. is all groovy yeah totally all right cool well let's let's wrap this up dude so Thank you so much for being on here. You want to give people like give people your uh, where they can find you, what you're up to, what you got going on and stuff like that. Uh, heck yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Luke. This Absolutely. has been a, a, a dang blast. I've had a t uh, time of my life. Uh, oh. You can find Dimension 20, uh, College Humor's actual play show over on dropout.tv. Uh, or you can also find us on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash Dimension 20 show. We have a bunch of free seasons of the show up on our YouTube channel. You can come check out the first season of Fantasy High, the first season of The Unsleeping City. Uh, we're an anthology show, so we got a bunch of different settings and campaigns you can check out. Uh, we have Escape from the Blood Keep, which is a, a side quest on our YouTube channel you can check out uh, that has uh, Matt Mercer, Erica Ishii, Ify Wadiwe, Amy Vorpal, Mike Trapp, uh, Rekha Shankar, uh, uh, please, you know, uh, come check that out. Um, uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Brennan LM, uh, and, uh, on Instagram at Brennan Lee Mulligan. Awesome. That's awesome, dude. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been really cool. Like I can just tell by talking with you, like you've been DMing for a while, you know, your crap. And so there's, I feel like, I feel like you just like dumped tons of amazing information out on us. So I love this crap, man. Oh, like my man, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it is it is a deep honor to meet someone as deep in the crunch as myself. I am very happy <laughs> to dive deep on like challenge rating and, oh, and counter design. Give it to me, baby. Dude, yeah, this and, and the, the, the great thing is these are the things that on the day to day dungeon masters are trying to figure out. You know what I mean? And so for these sure. are yeah. So it's really good stuff. So thank you so much for coming on, man. And. Yeah.